Thanks for finding Discovery Class. There's an old French proverb that says this. Life is like an onion. The more you peel, the more you're going to cry. It all means this. Life can be tough. And the longer you live, often the tougher it gets. In our class, we've been studying personalities in the Bible. Today's personality may seem strange to many of you. He's hardly ever studied. To a Christian, he isn't strange at all. But to the world, nobody believes that he even exists. When the stories of life intensify and the storms come, this personality is often there. When adversity strikes and life takes a nosedive, this personality is there. When life's treacherous assaults hit and your knees buckle, you'll find that he's there too. Whenever hardship strikes, you usually do two things. One, it either strengthens your beliefs or it unravels your faith. How you respond to that is what I want to talk to you today about it in our lesson. The personality that I'm going to tell you about is Satan, the devil, the man of perdition. The tempter. He's been called the enemy of the soul. And he was present when the world was created. He was the one who made man fall. Sin entered the world through him. And it's been with us ever since. And the problem of good and evil, it's all because of him. And there are two forces in this life. I just told you that. One is the force of evil, and the other is the force of good. Now you have to make a choice of which one you're going to follow. That's temptation. And we all have to make the choice. And you know who else made the choice? Jesus did. He had to make the choice how and what he chose is written for us in Matthew chapter 4. I'll read it for you. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread, and you can eat them. But he answered and said, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand at the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you're the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands... They will bear you up so that you will not even strike your foot against the stone on the bottom. Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain, and he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. And he said to him, All these things I'm going to give you if you'll fall down and just worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Go. Go. Satan, get out of here. It is written, You shall not worship the Lord your God and serve him. Only you shall him only. The devil left him. And behold, the angels came. And they began to minister to him. That's Matthew's account. Throughout my adult, adult life, I was a blood donor. And when I'd go on a holiday, 
I would go to the local hospital and I'd usually give a pint of blood. And I was just a walk-in guest. They didn't know I was coming. I did that in Jerusalem. And the main hospital was on a hill just above Garden of Gethsemane down in the valley. And it was there on the seventh floor of that hospital that I donated a pint of blood. But looking out the window from my cot where I laid, I asked the nurse who was attending, what's all that barren land out there? She said, in the Bible, Jesus was tempted in the wilderness. That's what you're looking at. It all happened right out there. Okay, let's look at what happened. In Matthew 4, Matthew opens with a description of Jesus' ministry. His official ministry hasn't started yet. Jesus is only 30 years of age, a single adult. His 12 disciples haven't been called yet. He's just left the carpenter shop in Nazareth. He hasn't preached his first sermon yet, nor has he healed any of the sick. He's virtually an unknown. We do know who he is, though, and where he came from. At his recent baptism at the Jordan River by John, his message and coming mission was all spelled out by God's announcement. This is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased, said a voice from heaven. Matthew 3.17 Jesus, having heard that, Immediately, he shows up outside that window where I was staring and donating blood. Jesus has just fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. Now weakened, no food, having endured that cold, harsh desert element, Satan shows up and he makes his move and he puts on these temptations. Did you know that when you're most vulnerable, Satan knows that. And that's when he pounces. That's when he's going to come. Jesus is going to be pounced on, and not once, not twice, but three times, and each one more intense than the other. And Jesus is going to resist. When I tell you what happened, I want you to do the same. Matthew's going to describe all three temptations, and he wants his readers to catch the force, and he also wants to catch the taunting language that Satan uses to bring him down. Now keep in mind what Jesus' mission was. For coming to earth, he came to die. He came to pay for your sin and mine. God told him, your purpose on earth was to go to the cross. Do you know who else knew that? Satan did. And he's going to do his best to not let Jesus go to Calvary and die. He's going to try and trick Jesus into this before his mission even begins, and his attack is going to come on three fronts. And I want you to look at them. Here's the first one. I call it attacking your feelings. Jesus is hungry. He hasn't eaten in a long time, 40 days and 40 nights. That's a long time. Turn these stones into bread. It's easy to take matters into your own hand. When you're weak. Jesus has grown weak. He's been starving. He hasn't eaten anything. Satan knew that. And what he's really telling Jesus, you really have the power to do anything. Stones into bread. That's easy for you. The wilderness was littered with stones. Jesus could have started a bake shop. How better to start a public ministry? People all over Judea would beat a path through his door. Do you know why? They got free bread, they got hot buns, they got sourdough loaves, sticky scones, 
fruit tarts? Satan is suggesting, Jesus, you could become the Messiah and never have to go to the cross. Jesus wasn't fooled. He replied, man shall not live by bread alone, but on every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. That's a good answer. On an empty stomach. Jesus didn't reply to his own physical needs. He was addressing something far bigger than that. He was speaking of the human soul. His coming was to do the Father's will and fulfill a much greater purpose. Namely, he restoreth my soul. That's why Jesus went to the cross. That restoration only took place there. Have you been tempted by Satan at your point of weakness? Maybe not. Satan often tempts us at our point of strength. Are you good looking? When you look in the mirror, are you cuter than anything else that's looked in that mirror? Satan wants you to be conceited. He wants to brag about you through your lips and tell others how good you are and show off. Maybe you're rich in vocabulary. You're a graduate of Oxford University. Do you know that Satan wants those words spelled out to justify how haughty you are? Because if you use big words, people are going to be stunned and they're going to probably look at you in admiration and you'll, but you'll burst your buttons. Maybe you got a high IQ. You're witty. You're classier than those around you. Satan wants you to brag about it. He wants you to tell everybody that you're a member of Mensa. And on your face, you express it to others. Eat your heart out. Don't you wish you were me? Satan loves that. Maybe you're a leader. You are a born director. You got a master's in business. And you're going to be somebody like a Hitler or a Joe Stalin. And you're going to have gifts to create Auschwitzes and you're going to have gifts to create gulags and you're going to destroy innocent people. And you're going to find that you're the master now. And they're just your servants, and you couldn't be happier putting other people down or even destroying them. Picture Jesus, hungry, weak in body, never more vulnerable to Satan's attack. What'd he do? He resisted, and he won. What did Satan do? He kept right on persisting. He's bound that he's going to take Jesus down, and he attacks Jesus' feelings, but he lost. Now watch what he does. Satan wants Jesus to become a Superman. He's going to be his new high draft choice quarterback, leading his team. So what does he do? He takes Jesus to Jerusalem Tower. It's 450 feet above the Kidron Valley. It's the highest pinnacle in the city of Jerusalem. And it's at the top of the Jewish temple, of all places, place of worship. And in our language, that's 45 stories high. There at the tower's edge, Satan tells Jesus, Since you call yourself the Son of God, I want you now to jump. I'll bet your angels will catch you. It'll only be just like a little bungee jump. Safe. You'll be just as safe as can be. You won't even touch the stones down there. Sensationalism. It's a great attraction. Preachers use it all the time. It's a perfect promoter. Jesus would become the wonder hero. The tabloids of the day, they'd go crazy. The cable news would make it their headline. Everyone would become a believer. The crowd loves a superhero. Going to the cross? Forget it. Jesus wouldn't need to now. This is far more life-changing than dying on a cross. What did Jesus do? He could see right through Satan's motives. 
His response, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. I came to this world as a lamb. I came to be sacrificed. It was here on this earth that I was going to be slaughtered. There's no trick that Satan can pull that's greater than the power of the cross. Satan has been in the alluring business for, for years. Jesus resisted. He had no part in becoming a crowd pleaser. So, the second test failed. Jesus didn't bite to become a superman. Now comes the third and final test. Satan is going to show Jesus that he can become a world ruler. From the peak of the temple to the top of Mount Everest. I made that up. It was a mountain, however, doesn't say where, but it was high enough that Jesus could see the kingdoms of the known world. And there before them stretched lands and empires and side by side, Satan and Jesus, they stood shoulder to shoulder viewing a beautiful sight that was ripe for the taking for a world ruler. Something that Satan didn't know. God had plans for his son to rule the kingdom of this world. But none of those plans included Satan. The father's plan would only be fulfilled through suffering. Satan, Lucifer is other, his other name, he knew that the cross was coming and he also knew what it meant. It meant the place of Satan's doom. Satan was going to be destroyed on the cross. If Jesus went to the cross, Satan would lose. This third temptation would only work if Jesus became the world leader and Satan was in command. Satan's control would be Jesus, obeying and worshiping him, not the Lord God Almighty. Jesus doesn't hesitate with his response. Satan, he says, go, get out of here. It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only will I serve. Just say no. With that, Matthew concludes, concludes his statement. He says, and the devil left him. Isn't it interesting? The devil left him. Adrian Wenz was 15 years old when his mother died. The Wenz family, they lived in Antwerp, Belgium in the year 1573, where his father, Matthew, he was a brick mason. Adrian was his oldest of three children. His sister was three years younger, and he had a little brother who was only three years old. Adrian's parents were Mennonites by faith. They were part of the faith community in Belgium. Adrian frequently helped his dad in his work as a mason, and it was his task to carry the bricks and place them within his father's reach and supply him with the mortar so that he could lay them. And he really admired his dad, not only for his skill and for his pride that he did, but also because of his faith. The best part of Adrian that he liked about working with his dad was hearing about his faith in Christ. He was a leader in his church, and his mother was a deaconess. His mother's name was Macon. She loved her Bible and memorized portion after portion, and she loved talking to Adrian and telling him about the cross and Jesus' suffering. He loved both knowledge and love that she had for him, and she knew her Bible so well that she could quote him scripture for any question she asked of her mom. Well, during this time in Belgium and throughout Europe, the Inquisition was raging. That was the armed forces against the church. Satan uses governments to torture and to put to death innocent people. 
especially Christians. And the devil's plan was to divide families by killing both parents or one or the other. And that would divide the family. Their faith would be destroyed. And they would be separated. Well, Adrian's mother, Macon, she was arrested along with six other ladies and they were sent to prison. That prison became Mrs. Wynn's wilderness where Satan would try to conquer her, just like he did Jesus. And her prison temptations were as powerful as those that Jesus faced in the wilderness. Satan tried to force her to, to deny her faith in Christ. And she could have been set free if she did. Just simply say, no, I don't believe in Jesus. He's not mine. Instead, she was the opposite. She said, I will not denounce my faith in Christ. I'm a Christian. I'm a believer in him. He died for me. I will not deny him. He's my savior. Well, she wrote a letter to her family confirming her stand and her faithfulness. And young Adrian, he sent a letter back in return and said something like this. Way to go, mom. The authorities on earth, they've had power over you, but they didn't win. You've got power in heaven on your side. Quote scripture to them just like you did me. And every time they give you something to turn you down, give them a scripture to lift you up. Do you know, what I'm going to tell you has a powerful ending. Mrs. Wins, she was accused. She was prosecuted. She was convicted for being a heretic against the state church. And you know what happened to her? She was executed. She was burned at the stake. Adrian's father couldn't witness the burning in October the 5th, 1573, there in that town square in Antwerp, Belgium. He was too overwrought with sorrow. But he said to his son, Adrian, Adrian, would you go and witness your mother's passing? Adrian at 15, imagine, just a teenager, went down to the town square, took his place, and he watched the six ladies being brought out, tied to the stake. And there they were going to die. Imagine that, watching your own mother. He watched his mother. And in the raging fire in that town square, Mrs. Wenz could say nothing. Do you know why? They had put a tongue tie on her tongue made of metal and it had a screw and it was so thick and it was so painful. She couldn't even moan. No voice came out of her. When the ashes remained and everyone left, Adrian left his position and he went over to where the fire had stopped burning and there was only ashes on the grass or rather on the stone. He dug in among them and he found the mouthpiece made of metal, the tongue tie, and he brought it home to his father who was at home mourning, who couldn't go to the execution. Do you think Satan won? On the back of the letter that Adrian had sent to his mother, she wrote her final words back to her son. And we have this in history. It's the only case of a martyr who had signed their name, and we have record of it when they were dying. That record is kept. That letter is still here. She wrote her finally wor final words to her son, and she signed it. And it was a martyr's lesson. And what a beautiful letter in history. Here's what it said. Oh, my son, Adrian, I am taken from you. Strive from your youth to fear God. You shall have your mother again. Only this time in the New Jerusalem, where parting will be no more. My dear son, 
I go before you. I want you to follow me. Forever yours, your loving mother. And she signed her name. Tell me, class, do you think Satan won? After her death, hundreds heard of her story and how she had been faithful and how she had left her husband and left her kids, never to see them again. But because of her stand and Satan's defeat, hundreds of women all over Belgium became believers because of her. Do you know, as I close, conclude, there are Mrs. Wins out there that God is still looking for. And there are Mr. Wins that are out there that God is still looking for. If you learn anything out of this lesson, Satan will never win when you have the cross on your side. You have your Bible to prove that's true. Well, that's enough for today. That's your personality. I hope you know something now about his personality. And I hope you will be a follower of the one who gave his life for you. See you next week. Please come back. I'll be watching for you.